Hello lovely people, welcome to part one of my August reading wrap up. Sophie vlogs. A small disclaimer before we jump into it, if this is more uh, jerkily edited than normal it's because my hay fever is in full force and I'm gonna try and cut out all of my sneezes. So I'll do the best I can, but all the trees, we're really feeling it today. Um, I read quite a lot in August, so I'm going to do this in two parts, but I'm just going to dive into it. I'm going to kick things off with uh, In Montparnasse, The Emergence of Surrealism in Paris from Duchamp to Dali, which is by Sue Rowe. Um, I was really interested in reading this because for a video that you won't have seen yet, I read the intimidating books on my TBR and one of them involved lots of surrealist art. Um, and surrealism is an art movement that I've never been particularly drawn to from like an aesthetic viewpoint, but I do think that there's a lot of interesting, um, I think it's a very interesting moment in history and there's this little overlap, like I've been reading more from the perspective of like learning about modernism and stuff and there's a bit of overlap with some of those people and that kind of thing. So um, I found this in a secondhand shop and I just thought I would dive in and get like an introduction to the movement. I definitely think that this was super readable. I have definitely come away with like a better understanding of surrealism and um, some of the principles behind it, I guess you would say. There's definitely people in this that are focused on much more than others. So like Andre Breton is one, Max Ernst is one, Man Ray is one. I think Man Ray is the only person that is really focused on here whose work I actually like. <laughs> so I did find it interesting, um, but definitely it's not a movement that like really makes me feel things. From um, the perspective of this book, one thing that I will say is that very few women talked about in this, and I know that there are women involved in the Surrealist movement because there is a book that is I have filed on my Goodreads to read that is called Women in the Surrealist Movement and the book that I read that inspired reading this had women's work mentioned. So the only women who are really focused on this are like in uh, discussing like their relationship to the men. So we have like people's wives, people's muses and stuff like this, but I was disappointed that there were no like actual women artists focused on. Um, I'm sure people who are more familiar with the Surrealist movements might have things to say on in regards to the level of focus on certain artists because there are definitely like there are people in this that I now understand with a lot more depth but I'm sure that there are lots of different Surrealists that are sort of uh, just not included in here. I liked learning about sort of like the overlap between like Dadaism and Surrealism and sort of like the differences but also how a lot of people who were involved in Dadaism sort of became involved in Surrealism, that kind of thing. So coming out of this I definitely think that this was a really good like accessible, readable like introduction to Surrealism. At no point was I like confused, overwhelmed, any of that. It's definitely given me like a grounding. There are books that I have in mind that I want to go off and read in order to sort of like flesh that out further. So this is one that I like, if you like me, are like, what is surrealism? Who are these people? It definitely like did that. It's just, I think sometimes when you're trying to do these like broad, accessible, easy to access books, like you just, you, there's, you know, you have to draw a line somewhere. It's just, I, I definitely came away and I was like, I feel like maybe some of the focus is a bit um, skewed towards specific people and like, where's my women? <laughs> After that I want to talk about The Passion According to Renee Vivian, which is by Maria Mercier Macal, which is translated from Catalan by Kath Kathleen McNerney and Helena Buffery. Um, this is sort of like tangentially related to these, I kind of read these at the same time, although these are very different uh, moments of history and that kind of thing. The link in my brain is that when I was doing some non-fiction reading about modernism earlier this year, um, some of these people overlapped with some of the people talked about there, but Renee Vivian was also a um, person who was tangentially mentioned. And then I found this book, which is, um, this. it's one of those books that's like kind of hard to discuss, Essentially, the whole book revolves around Renée Vivian, who was a... Technically, she was British, but she wrote in French, and she very much, like, identified with Paris and France and all of that. Um, and she had, like, high-profile relations with, like, Natalie Barney, stuff like this. But she died by suicide very young. And so this novel is kind of attempting to look at the figure of Renee Vivian. What I liked about it is that it, it's it's attempting to look at her but it's 
it's not really attempting to pin down like one narrative of who this woman was. We get such a like kaleidoscopic look at her through so many different perspectives that all, um, obviously it's a fiction novel, but it, it goes between different people's perspectives on her and you get to sort of see the, the myriad different ways that you can interpret this woman and both like her work, but also her person and who she was and her different relationships that kind of thing and I quite liked that this sort of it felt like it was like self-aware and acknowledging that you can never really tell one ver like just one version of someone's life because it doesn't exist because depending on their relationships like they'll have different people have different interpretations of them based on their their interactions and stuff like this and so this is filtered through um two main narrators that we have is one of them is a 1980s Catalan documentary filmmaker and one of them is a 1920s French archaeology scholar and museologist and like both of these people obviously never met this woman but they have such strong ideas of who she is and they're both trying to like um I felt like particularly with um Salomon Reinach who is the 1920s French archaeology scholar like it really felt like he was trying to like claim who Rene Vivian was because he would like reject some people's uh he would he was like very greedy for um people's interactions with Renee Vivian like pr their letters with her and that kind of stuff to like collect it all and he felt like an it was almost like he had like an ownership of who she was and he would like tell other people about her in a way and it would be like an accomplishment to get them hooked on the idea of her but it was a very specific idea that he had built up and he like rejects other people's interpretations that don't tally up with his idea of her despite the fact that these people are people who did know her and he did not um I found that interesting. I also wasn't really sure about the, the documentary filmmaker is Sarah T and I also wasn't sure about her interpretation of Renee Vivian either because it's very influenced by like her own like romantic uh, experiences and where she's at with that and all that kind of stuff. So, but I think that is somewhat the point is, is that this is like really diving in, trying to capture someone and just coming up with like pieces and being like, Here's a collection of pieces. Like, try and build a person out of those pieces. Like, can you? Like, when the person is gone. From from a, a narration standpoint, I, I felt like I could... It's interesting, because I was going to say I felt like I could tell that Maria Mercé Macal is a poet, because it was a very, like, poetic telling. Like, uh, I have seen this critique of being like, does it need so many adjectives? Does it need so many descriptions? And I was like, yes, it does! <laughs> really enjoyed them but also I would say like kudos to the translators for that because I can only imagine the challenge of um, trying to translate and not just retain meaning but retain poeticism and all of that kind of thing it's always so fascinating to think about when you're reading like literature in translation um, particularly because there's two translators and I'm like wow that must be such an interesting process to not just be translating how you interpret it but discussing how you are both interpreting it and sort of where do you settle with that I don't know on the whole I really enjoyed this it was sort of like a vision into a world in which that I've read some non-fiction about but definitely don't consider myself a pro on. What I would be really interested to, to sort of uh, explore is reading the thoughts of people who are much more familiar with Renee Vivian's life and that kind of thing because she's a person that I tangentially know through some non-fiction reading but I don't, I'm not familiar enough with her to know about like the presentation of her life events and the other people in her life and her relationships with them and that kind of thing. I'm, I'm not familiar enough to know whether that is something that would be considered like particularly well done or not. I don't know. So I enjoyed this from like a, I liked the narration. I really liked trying to get to know this figure through like all of these different perspectives and sort of coming away and being like, like, I guess the only way to really know Renee Vivian is to read her writing. Things. Um, but then that is so subjective, you know, like all of that kind of process. I had a really fun time. I also did a reread. I listened to um, Taste My Life in Food by Stanley Tucci. Uh, I read this for the first time last year and I really enjoyed it. Stanley Tucci is a very classy man. <laughs> um, but I wanted to re I wanted to listen to this as a reread because I knew that the audiobook is narrated by him and I definitely enjoyed like his delivery of things. The parts of his uh, memoir that I find most interesting interesting are the ones that are to do with like um his family going to Italy and those experiences uh his experiences in the acting world like there's a whole chapter that is just about like the different types of catering you get in like different countries that he's worked in and that kind of thing which I really enjoyed also there are occasionally like these sections that are like um like 
conversations like between him and family members I did not enjoy those so much they're not so good on audio because it's like me says a thing my mother says a thing me says a thing and i just I, those were not so fun but um this was very lovely i also i listened to it with my partner which was really fun um i have to confess we listened to a lot of this when we were suffering with food poisoning and there's nothing like being so ill <laughs> because of food and then listening to someone tell you about beautiful food it was like a great reminder in like when i was feeling horrible that like actually food is joyous and wonderful and not just a source of pain <laughs> So that was fun. With aforementioned food poisoning, I also just wanted a really easy, cosy read. So I picked up You'll Be Sorry by Kim M. Watt, which is the second book in the Beaufort Scales Cozy Mystery series. I reviewed the first one of these, I think, in my July wrap up. And I think I said that it was like perfectly fun. I had a nice time. Um, and I was going to see what the second book felt like. I enjoyed this one a lot more, actually might be strange to read a Christmas themed mystery in August but hey ho it was the perfect thing for the time. Whereas the first novel is like a murder mystery this one is more of a mystery in regards to um, some things are being stolen, it seems like this WI in this small town is being targeted, this is a world in which like dragons exist but there's their um, existence is kind of kept secret so there's this WI who know that they exist and then now at this point there's a DI who knows that they exist but otherwise they're sort of still a mystery so they're trying to solve mysteries but also not be exposed in the process what i really liked about this one is that there was far more focus on dragon society like the nature of the first book is that you have to set up your pieces and then you can explore them with more fullness later but i enjoyed the um getting an understanding of how this dragon society works. I also now know that there are more than just dragons in this world, and I think that that's something that will be exciting to explore further. Um, there's so much, like, the whole appeal of this really is that it's, like, cosy and sweet and lovely. It's not really one to, like, try and work out the mysteries. It's one to just, like, have a fun little frolic. And because it's set at Christmas, there were so many beautiful descriptions of, like, baking and Christmas food and all of these lovely things that I just enjoyed so much. So this went down, I think, for me a bit better than the first one. It's not that I didn't like the first one, but it, based on this, it appears to be like growing in a direction that I'm interested in. It was cosy, it was sweet, it was very comforting at the time when I was very ill, so I definitely enjoyed that. I also read The Story of the Stone, Volume 1, by Zhao Zhu Jin. Um, this is Volume 1. Oh, who's this translated by? This is translated by David Hawkes. Um, this is a volume one, I think this is about five volumes in its totality. So, um, I, it's a extremely classic piece of Chinese literature. It's published around circa 1760, um, sort of, it's known as the Stories of the Stone, but also the Dream of the Red Chamber. And this is part one, which begins the tale of Bao Yu, who is like a gentle boy growing up in this family. Really, it's like a look at this family and sort of their fortunes have very much been on the rise and I gather that I think they're gonna maybe hit some family difficulties kind of soon. Um, so it's like a really like expansive, very slow paced tale that is just like rooted in, there are, there are quite a lot of characters, although there are like specific ones that you spend most time with. Um, I was really surprised by how readable I found this. It's it's that thing of like when you're picking up literature from like the 1700s, like how accessible is that going to be? And this one I found like so easy to read and sort of that element of being like a family drama in many ways. I think although there are lots of names to hold in your mind and that kind of thing, because you are just like rooted in one family, I found that like a really good like anchor point. Some of my favourite bits of this were bits that kind of went a little bit like um, fantastical. So there's like a bit where like Bao Yu is uh, as sort of like a lesson to him. Um, this fairy called Disenchantment like takes, like he goes to sleep and then he meets this fairy called Disenchantment and she like takes him like through the like sort of fairy kingdom and she's showing him things that she's like trying to like warn him and be like get your act together. Like this lies in, this is what lies in the future, that kind of thing. And he's just like not getting it. Um, but that sort of like strangely fantastical sequence I really enjoyed. Um, Zheng Fu was one of my favourite characters. I thought she was great. There are so many like women in this that are like quite different from each other. I really appreciated that like each one of the women in this has like a very distinct personality. I didn't always understand some of the behaviours. <laughs> 
but like distinct personalities for sure. I do think there were a couple of other moments where I like lacked the information needed to get stuff out of things. So there's like a moment, there's like a whole book really where they are um, walking around this like newly landscaped garden. It's like they need to put poetry at specific points and it's like they're arguing about which poetry would be best. Dayu's father is like really mean to him but also kind of pleased by the type of poetry he's suggesting and that like dynamic I was like I feel like I'm probably missing like contextual awareness to understand like why this is the way it is and also with a lot of the like poetry quoted I was like boy if I knew these original things I would probably be getting more out of it so like there were moments um, because it's it's quite long it's like 500 and something pages there were certain books where definitely like the plot I was like okay I'm less interested in this but I think that's just because I lack the knowledge needed to like pull out of this what's going on but on the whole I really enjoyed this I found it eminently readable and I, I think I'm gonna keep my eyes peeled for volume two and give that a go at some time maybe I'll read the whole thing if I really get on with it I don't know but um I've been enjoying exploring like you know some of the penguin black classics kind of like topics for sure and so this was like an interesting one to like file to the brain Another piece of non-fiction is Uproar, Satire, Scandal and Printmakers in Georgian London by Alice Loxton. Um, this was a really fun, engaging piece of non-fiction. We are sort of um, starting by establishing like what satire is. So the first few like chapters we are really like looking at like sort of art history and looking at like concepts like caricature um, and that kind of thing and how where the origins of like satire is um, particularly in regards to like looking at like the grotesque and that kind of thing and like how this then became this set style which in the Georgian times really took off um, and we also we're like focused around three specific people so Tom Rowlandson, Isaac Cruikshank and god I can never remember the third person's name what is your name oh James Gilray that's who you are sorry uh, my brain is full of hay fever <laughs> The, the narrative structure is kind of like we, we start with following Tom Rowlandson and then um, we follow his career to a point and then we introduce these other people as they crop up and so we're looking a little bit at politics of the time, like we have to know what is happening, that what they're drawing on, that kind of thing. How much these uh, this idea of not just doing drawing the satire but how vital um, print was to it and how print as a forum changed, like how not just like what for politics are you drawing on to make these drawings but also how are you distributing them on a mass scale and how does that change your approach to making them and that kind of thing that was super interesting I really really enjoyed the way she shined the focus that was like okay well these are the three names of the people that like if you are interested in this topic you know but actually who are the names of the people behind publishing them because they are just as much a part of distributing these things around and um, so really really enjoyed that focus and then uh, it's it's very like biographical of these people so we follow you get even if you're familiar with their work you might not be familiar with their lives is what I'm saying because my partner is very familiar with a lot of the um, prints and stuff in this but has less familiarity with the actual lives of these people so I'm gonna lend it to him after this then also like the decline and fall of this type of like artwork and that kind of thing because like with the Victorian era this became something that was very much frowned upon um, so yeah, super duper interesting. One thing I will say is that Alice Loxton as a historian writes with like a lot, there's a lot of energy in this that I really enjoyed. Um, she does make a lot of comparisons that are sort of like positing things in a context in which like contemporary people might understand it so she does a lot of like comparisons like as like shorthands for like connecting things if that makes sense so um, I can definitely tell she's a historian who I know does a lot of like social media posts and that kind of thing to make history accessible to like younger generations so that is definitely an element in this occasionally like some of those comparisons I was like <laughs> but I did genuinely really enjoy this and I thought it was like a really vibrant piece of historical non-fiction. And then finally the last book I want to talk about is The Whale Rider by Witi Ihimera which is trans uh, which is narrated not translated sorry <laughs> which is narrated by Jay Lagaya. Um, I have to say a big shout out to how much I enjoyed listening to this as an audiobook. 
Um, the narration was so good. Like, he just has such a nice voice. <laughs> like, when he was just, like, narrating, I was like, your voice is lovely. But also, there's, like, a recurring thing in the audiobook where you have, like, this snippet of song that happens, like, in between, sort of, like, the chapters. And there's also, um, as part of this, like, uh, narrative storytelling, like, the chapters, like, end with this repeated phrase and the way that he, like, delivered that I really enjoyed. And then because there is Maori spoken throughout the text, like, having that actually be spoken by a narrator who is Maori was, like, really, really great. I realise I've not told you anything about what this book is about, I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> this is about this particular Maori tribe and um, the newest generation of children to be born. Uh, it is tradition that the firstborn oldest is a boy and then that boy takes up the mantle of chief um except in this case it is a girl called kahu and um she's very much like rejected by her grandfather because he had wanted there to be a boy um but as may become apparent like she is actually like holder of knowledge and all of that kind of thing like uh it, it's quite clear as the book progresses that she is supposed to be the natural successor and one of the main conflicts of this book is the continual like rejection by her grandfather of her and that kind of thing um and then also the whales where this starts is with the tale of the original whale rider and it was like this human and this whale um and they were bonded and they would ride the oceans together and they would throw these spikes out which would be like animals and plants and that kind of thing and help populate like the world and then the human had to go his separate ways because he had to go um build a tribe and populate the world in that way and so then like it's looking at like modern contemporary like it's written in the 80s but like contemporary to that time like relations between like these people and these whales and how that there is much more of a separation now and that kind of thing and so part of Kahu taking up this mantle is also her involvement in like healing that rift and that kind of thing as a result of this, there are sections that are from the whale's point of view, and I loved those sections. I just thought that they were really beautiful. Um, they also like really highlighted one of my other favourite things about this was um, a lot of the descriptions. There was a real like musicality to some of the descriptions used. So like there's one where like the whales are going to the Arctic and it describes like sheets of ice hitting against each other like a glissando. And I just like that description has really stayed with me because it was lovely. Um, so I really, really enjoyed sort of some of those descriptive ways um, and that kind of thing. Um, I have to say I'm still not 100% sure on who the audience for this book is. Uh, I think it's talked about a lot as a middle grade because Kahu is a child. I would say it's more of like a YA that could also be read by adults, I think, because some of the things, the perspective is actually from Kahu's uncle. And he goes off and has like various life experiences. So like he ends up in Papua New Guinea and there's like a whole section that's really drawing a parallel between the experience of native people in Papua New Guinea and the Maori. And that culminates in like quite a tragic happening. And also there's like, uh, as part of this journey with the whales, there is an event that happens um, where there is some quite distressing whale death given in detail. I don't think it's a spoiler to mention that, but I am mentioning it because it was quite visceral and it, it's supposed to be visceral. Like you're supposed to feel that re like reaction to it. Um, it's just thinking about a, a younger reader reading it. I think that that would be potentially quite distressing. So that's why I think this is probably more of a YA, um, which is my, my main thing that I found uh, less enjoyable about it is that if you are supposed to have that slightly more grown up um, sort of reader, some sometimes the repetition of uh, Kahu tries to do something and her grandfather is like rejects her like that does go on for quite a while so as like a more mature reader that could be a bit frustrating but equally I do wonder if it's supposed to be frustrating because you are supposed to feel that deep frustration and be like come on my pal just get it together. Kahu because you're not in Kahu's head you very much have like this outsider perspective on her and um I think at times like she does come across very like idealized as like this perfect little child but my favorite moments were um there's a bit near the start where you get very much like flashes of like a mischievous child that I really enjoyed but then also there's this like really important scene where um Kahu is always very persistent with her grandfather and she loves him very very much and there's this like one scene where he like really lets her down in like a very public way and you get this like realization of this child who is like being viewed by a lot of people and is having to like really try and keep it together but you can just see her like wilting and that 
really made me so sad because that felt like so real when I was like listening to it I was like oh my god like it's it's like seeing in public the moment a child loses like a little bit of innocent faith in someone and that like really got me <laughs> So on the whole, I really enjoyed this. I think my experience with this book was really enhanced by listening to it on audiobook. Um, so I would really recommend that for sure. Um, that's everything I want to talk about in this part one wrap up. If probably going to post part two next week or the week after, depending on editing Sophie. Uh, but I would really love to hear any of your thoughts on any of the books in this first half. Uh, please do tune in for my second half, whenever that happens.